Hi everybody, I'm Razvi. Have you ever wondered why, when writing data into memory in order to, for example, hijack a given program's execution flow, we must reward the bytes we are writing? In other words, have you ever wondered why do we have to swap their endianness? We usually do it using functions like pack 32 bits p32 from Puntools or pack 64 or using struct, which is native to Python. Struct is used to interpret bytes as packed binary data, and we have to specify the endianness we want it to parse and also the data type we are working with. Do you know why this is necessary? Well, that's what we're about to see in this video. What endianness is, how does it work, and why is it necessary? Why is it a must? Now, let us take a moment here to really understand what this byte ordering or endianness thing is. Sorry if my handwriting isn't very good, or should I say mouse writing, since I'm using the mouse, but I think it'll do for now. There are literally hundreds of online resources where you can read more about endianness, byte ordering, what it is, and how does it happen in memory. I remember when I started learning binary exploitation, I spent quite some time understanding and figuring out how it actually works. How does it affect the exploits? Now that I understand it, I must say it's a pretty important concept in general when working and programming for computers. And of course, especially when you have to deal with low level data arrangement into memory and working with CPUs. Talking about online resources, I will leave in the description of this video some links where you can learn more about NDNS. And if you're curious about it, I encourage you to take a look and read more about the Nuxi problem. It is related with all of this. Now let us get into it. I will sum up what for me are the most important aspects of NDNS regarding binary exploitation. Let us suppose we are working with a 32 bits machine, 32 bits architecture. And we want to represent in memory the following number, okay? That's hexadecimal for dead beef. The first thing we have to think about is how long this number actually is. In this case, it is four bytes long. We have the first byte here, the second byte here, the third one, and finally the last and fourth byte. This 0x at the beginning is just notation that we human use when working with hexadecimal. Now the next thing we have to think about is which bytes from this number right here are the least and most significant bytes. The least significant byte is always the byte in the lowest position and the most significant byte is always in the highest position. The way we humans generally understand and represent numbers is from right to left, even though we write them in either direction. That is, for us, the lowest, the least significant byte, sorry, is always on the right whereas the most significant byte is on the left of the number. Now for computers, it isn't always like this. Enter little endian and big endian. These two byte ordering schemes or endianess schemes refer to what is being written in the lowest address. Both of them refer to the lowest address. In other words, they specify, they determine what is being written first. In little endian, the least significant byte is being written in the lowest address, memory address. On the contrary, with big endian, the most significant byte is being written in the lowest memory address. For instance, let's say that this is our memory, where we have some memory spaces. Here is where we are writing our bytes in memory. This will be our address 0. This is address 1, 2, 3, and so forth. This means that our lowest address is this one right here, and memory grows towards higher addresses in this fashion. Now, as you may already know, writing into memory always happens from lowest towards higher addresses. Let us try to represent this number we have right here in little endian. As we have just seen, in little endian scheme, the least significant byte is always written in the lowest address first. That is, we will represent here the EF byte, B E A D and finally DE. That's how you represent this number in little endian. On the contrary, in big endian, you represent first the most significant byte. 
that is G E A D B E E F. As you can see, we humans think about and speak in Big Endian, but computers are a bit more complex. Now, let us imagine that we are in a 64 bit machine and we want to represent the very same number. As we have seen, this number is 4 bytes long, so we have to convert it into 8 bytes, which is the addressing or wording for 64 bits. Imagine we want to represent this number in 8 bytes, regardless of the size of an integer, for example. What we can do is, of course, padding to the left with zeros. That gives us 4 more bytes, null bytes in this case, at the left of our number. Now, this implies that our most significant byte isn't this one anymore. The most significant byte, regardless of its value, even though we see here it is zero, and as you already know, zeros to the left are meaningless. Now, our most significant byte is this one right here. So, in Little Endian, the representation remains almost exactly the same. We have now four more bytes here. And to represent this new number in Little Endian, we have, of course, to fulfill these bytes with their respective value, which is zero. They are null bytes. And what happens with our Big Endian scheme? Well, as we've previously discussed, in Big Endian, the most significant byte is being written at the lowest address. That implies that our representation goes like this. That's how you represent this number right here in a 64-bit machine, 64-bit architecture. You have to bear in mind that byte ordering always happens when you are writing data into memory, not only with numbers, but of course, representing and understanding it with numbers is easier. It happens every single time you are writing data into memory, regardless of its nature, because Endianes defines how this data will be later interpreted by the computer. Now, that's the theory. How about some practice to see how this actually works in memory? I have a small but enough C program here where I have defined two integers and assigned each one of them a given value. Notice that I'm using the hexadecimal notation to represent numbers in this code and that's totally perfect. Now let me compile this program and I'm going to compile it for 32 bits. As you can see, it is a 32-bit executable. And now let's debug the program to see what is it doing. I'm going to use Radar Echu to debug it, but you can use, of course, whatever debugger you like. AA to analyze the program. PDF, that stands for print disassembly function. And I'm going to print main. Now we can read the code, even though I don't know if this color combination is the most appropriate one. Anyways, we can see we have two variables. We also see that the program is moving into 4H, the value dead beef as a double word, and the value fill in 8H. Let us place a breakpoint right here. Instruction DB, that stands for debug breakpoint. And now let's execute a program with debug continue. We see now that we have hit our breakpoint. Now let us inspect this tag to see how these values are actually arranged into memory. PXR, that stands for print, hexadecimal, and human readable at RBP, sorry, EBP minus eight. Okay, there's a lot of stuff, so we can limit the number of bytes we want to see on the screen. And here are leaving our values. Now my question is, where is Little Endian applied if we can see the values just as we are writing them? Wasn't all of this supposed to be swapping their position since we are working with a Little Endian machine? Where, in fact, it is swapping their bytes. But as we are printing as human readable, the debugger is converting the number for us in order to make our life easier. Now let's say I want to print hexadecimal at the very same address. As you can see, starting at the address b0, we have b0, b1, b2, b3, b4, and so forth. Now remember, since we are working with a 32-bit machine, each cell memory from the stack is 4 bytes long, as you can see. That means that our first number is saved in this space right here, the next stack memory cell is this one right here, and so forth. 
Now let us take a moment to see what is actually happening here. Let us talk first about the number field. Its least significant byte is the one on the right, whereas the most significant byte is the one on the left. In this case, the number is only two bytes, so they are close together. As we've seen in Little Endian, least significant byte gets written first at the lowest address. In our case, the lowest address is the address number zero. And our least significant byte is E1. Take a look what we have represented in the lowest address. Our most significant byte is FE, which is of course written in the next position, in a higher address. Given that we declared this variable as an integer that is 32 bits long, which is 4 bytes, in fact our most significant byte is the leftmost null byte, because whatever we don't specify gets padded with zeros. In other words, this is our number in Little Endian. Let us take a look now of what is happening with our big number, which is dead beef. This number is of course 4 bytes long, with the least byte being the one on the right and the most significant byte being the one on the left. Our least significant byte is EF, which is placed right here. As you can see, EF is being written first. Our most significant byte is DE, which is right here four bytes higher, four addresses higher. As you can see, numbers do get rearranged into memory. The Indian scheme is always applied. The bytes are swapped, their order is changed. And that's the very reason why we have to manually change the bytes ordering and fulfill with zeros to the left whenever it's needed when we are into binary exploitation, because we don't have a compiler that interprets our code, we are overwriting and manually writing into memory, straight into memory. So we have to make sure that we respect the NDNS schemes so as for the CPU to understand what we want to say. Let us now take a look and see what happens if we are to compile this for 64 bits. And of course, use a bigger number which is 8 bytes long, as you can see. First, of course, the compiler warns us that there is an implicit integer overflow, because integers are by default 32 bits, regardless of the architecture you are compiling the binary for, whether it is 32 or 64 bits. Now you have to bear in mind that this is implementation specific. It depends on the language you are using. In Python, for example, integers have a way different behavior. In order to make use of bigger integers, like 64 bits integers, I will include the standard integer library that defines several data types as unsigned integer 64 or unsigned integer 32. Let us compile the binary once again for 64 bits. I should save the file, of course, first. And as you can see, there are no more warnings. When printing the stack, again, as human readable, we can see that we have our number right here, dead beef coffee babe, and what we can notice is that the program tries to optimize space, tries to don't waste allocated space in the stack, since the dead beef is a 4 bytes number and fill is a 2 bytes number, which of course gets padded with zeros, in other words, it is another 4 bytes number, they both fit in a single stack cell in a single stack memory address. They, of course, will get referenced whenever necessary as RBP-4 and RBP-8 or whatever the reference is, but they are placed in the same stack cell. This behavior is common in 64-bit binaries. Let us now take a look at the memory without the interpretation of the debugger. We can see it happen just the same. Here is our first number. Here we have our second number, which is, of course, swapped. And finally, we have dead beef coffee babe. As you can see, the whole number has been swapped. Full 8 bytes have been rearranged. Because in this big number, the least significant byte is the one on the right, which is BE, that gets written first. As you can see, we have it right here, BE. Our most significant byte is DE, which gets written last at the higher memory address. As you can see, here we have our DE. Now, let us say I have just a small number like this one. What would happen? As you can see, the compiler once again tries to optimize space as much as possible. Since our fill number is a four bytes long number, it gets placed in half a stack cell and then 
our A number that we declared of course in a 64 bits integer, that is the number is 8 bytes long regardless of its actual value. The A value that we gave this number, this variable, got padded with enough zeros in order to transform it into 8 bytes format. And then right next to it we have our dead beef coffee babe number. Now reading the hex dump of the memory as it is without uh, converting it into stack cells and human readable, we can see that our number field got of course padded with zeros to a to four byte format because it is a 32 bit integer and its end DNS got swapped. And our a number, as you can see, is represented as a eight byte long number that also got padded with zeros. Remember that this a value that we initialized our variable with is of course the same as padding with enough zeros to the left in order to convert it to 8 bytes format. These two values are the same and that's what happens here. Our least significant byte is 0a which you can see placed right here at a lower address and our most significant byte is of course the one on the left which got placed here at a higher memory address. And then our number dead beef coffee babe, which we previously discussed already. And this is how NDNS works and that's why it is so important because that's how the CPU understands the numbers we actually want to represent. Since this is the expected behavior for the CPU when it finds numbers or bytes in memory, and we, when performing a buffer overflow, for example, are manually overwriting all these memory addresses, we have, of course, to take into account that if we want the CPU to read a value like fill, we have to put it with zeros and then swap the endianess, and we have to manually do it. That's how we can get to overwrite variable values with our desired variable or overwrite the return address of main, for example. I hope you liked the video and found it useful. See you in the next one. Until then, GG.